Hi, everybody. I'm not doing PowerPoint. Um, I thought it was better that I would uh, listen to my esteemed colleagues and try to react to that and get a sense of who you are. Um, it's interesting to hear them speak because uh, my history, starting running at White Columns, my first show was Lee Quinones in 1980. And my second show, I think, was Peter Schuf, who used to be my assistant. I think he worked for 50 bucks a week, maybe something like that. Um, and after running White Columns, I couldn't get a job, and I didn't have any money, so I opened an art gallery. <laughs> because it seemed like a good idea at the time, and the notion of not knowing anybody who bought art didn't seem quite as foolish then. And I think part of what's going on with all of us is that was the advantages of being young, sort of inexperienced, and now we're in this sort of more mature, you know, white hair or kind of period, I am going to say that. And so our changes in life, I think, have to do, I think, with youth versus hopefully a little bit of wisdom. So I open a gallery much as like the Andy Hardy would throw a party. And um, it's interesting. I would say in the mid-'80s that three of maybe, the let's say, the five best galleries in New York for artists of our generation were Nicole, Jay, and myself. And of the 20 best galleries in New York at the time, I would say we were in that list. Now, it's kind of interesting to say none of us are doing that now. That's kind of significant. It made me reflect that, well, if you look in the 60s, how many galleries are still going that we could name? Not many. 70s, not many. 80s, fewer. 90s. So as this topic is sort of about the shift of the brick and mortar of the gallery system, I think it's always been a little bit that as people got more mature or as circumstances changes, change personally. I mean, for me, I closed my gallery because I was destitute, out of money, and the art market had collapsed. We haven't mentioned money yet, but that's sort of what happened in the 90s, and I know it affected all of us in different ways. But if the three, if three of the five best galleries of that period couldn't make it, that's meaningful. I mean, if we've got 600 galleries roughly in New York now, how many of them are really extraordinary? And we don't really talk about that. And how many of them are liable to still be, of the 600 now, how many are li liable to be flourishing 5, 10, 20 years from now? I'm going to say not many. And it's always sort of been that way. So I didn't have much choice. I think these guys had a little bit more choice. So mm -hmm. I closed my doors and I went, now what? And uh, I, I had heard this, this thing called the fax machine. So I created this newsletter called the Bear Fax, which was a by on terms. That's 21 years ago. It was kind of a shower idea that I had that <laughs> Jerry Saltz was supposed to be my partner. And that's a long story. And <laughs> lo and behold, people think that that's a big deal. Now we're not. But for me, it's not a very big deal. Running a gallery, representing artists, is a very significant act, activity that really adds a lot to the world of art. Being a newsletter, or even now, I'm an art, I've been an art advisor for 20 years. It's a very uh, satisfying activity to do. It's not quite as important as we have a number of galleries here running a gallery. Um, but it's something that's probably personally um, better. And I think all of us are also, after 30 or 40 years, you start to say, well, what's best for me versus what's best for the artist I work with? And it's a very hard switch to make, because for many years, we were really, you know, as a gallerist, you're the friend, you're the psychiatrist, you're the banker, you're the mother, you're the father of all these artists. And it's a very confusing power position where that relationship is really driven by the artist. And they're not our friends. We're their friends when they need something. They're not our friends when we need something. And it took a long time to understand that and to understand what was best for us. And I think largely what's happening for all of us is, well, what works for us as much as for the artist? Now, um, before we bring it to questions, which I think will be an important part, I think we were also lucky 
that we came of age in a golden age of art making. The late 70s, early 80s, it's like, oh my God, there's Cindy Sherman. She's sitting at Artist Space, but here's this photo, 100 bucks, what a great thing. And wow, I went down to see Jeff Koons. There's Richard Prince. And hey, I went to Europe. Have you ever heard of this guy named Gerard Richter? <laughs> no, but there's this other guy named Polky or something. And it was a magic time to be a young person in this business. I think today, the people who are running the art galleries are as knowledgeable and talented as we were. They just <coughs> happen to be coming of age in not maybe a glory time of art making. So in the sense that we talking about the bricks and mortar of the art business and the technical things about the art fairs and this and that, actually everything to do about the art world and the art business is really driven by the artists. And it's really up to them to be creating such exceptional art that is making so many people want to be involved. And I would argue that we're not really at you know, this golden age at the moment. Maybe that's because the art market has been the driving force. Maybe we've been over commercialized. Maybe we're getting too much attention. But it will happen again where the art will drive it. So, you know, I think there's, if you look through history, you'll see very few artists that are remembered through the ages. How many artists do we remember from the Renaissance? I can probably name two, but I didn't study art. Some of you, maybe 10. And that's the Renaissance. So while we have this system of 600 galleries in New York, or 800, and over 3 million artists in America working, how, is it likely that we're going to have you know, it's one thing, I, I had a conversation with Jerry Saltz, and I said, Jerry, I'm not interested in a million mediocre, respectable, okay artists. And Jerry said, well, I am, which was interesting and honest. I'm interested in five or 10 or 50. And again, I was fortunate that when I was 25, there were these people and you could see them. They're still around, and there will be that many, but this sort of over-convoluted system of 10 times as many collectors, 10 times as many galleries, oh, that's good, it's a nice job, you can tell your mom, you became an art dealer, they won't shout at you like they would have 40 years ago, that we're just in a different moment. We have a lot more noise going on. And I try to encourage people, let's try to blow his headphones or something, get rid of the noise and, and bring it down to the, the artists that, that are gonna really change everybody's view of the world. And that might be one we haven't met, maybe one that Jay went to studio today, or Nicole is championing. But that's the focus that you know I sort of see. So um, I'm gonna make one more point that's completely opposite to everything I've said. And that's kind of interesting. No, no, no one has really mentioned the internet as a new, we're talking sort of about the demise of the brick and mortar and the internet as a way of communication. Certainly we all email and, you know, right now people don't have a chemical view of art where you used to come in and smell the painting, look at it, think about it. You get a JPEG and you have 10 minutes to decide. Strangely enough, from my career, I also work for eBay and my job is to try to, to figure out a way for them to bridge these worlds. So it's an interesting challenge because it's the exact opposite of what all of us in this room, I think, are doing. So. Um, I just make these points in general and hopefully we can get to questions soon to find out what you guys really want to learn from all of us and we can argue between us. So thank you. Thank you.